Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidil mursalin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve baraka ve selleme teslimen kathiran ila yevmiddin amma ba'd. Kala Allahu tebaraka ve teala fil Kur'anil mecidi vel Furkanil hamid fabima rahmetim min Allahi linte lehum velev kunte fazzan galizal kalbi len faddu min havlik. Sadakallahul azim. İnşallah in our discussion today it will be about a really simple topic of gentleness. We're seeing with everything that's going on, there's a lot of high blood pressure, maybe a lot of tension, a lot of stress, a lot of frustration. And generally when these things happen, then some innate characteristics that we have, negative characteristics, they come to the fore, they give rise and they bubble up to the surface. Sometimes there's even an explosion of these things. So <clears throat> each of us are challenged with different things. Some people with maybe a bit of anger, some people with miserliness, some people with laziness, some people with cowardice, some, peop some people with overzealousness. They just want to be doing something all the time even if it's wrong. So each of us has some challenges. In a stressful situation, in a situation of stress and difficulty and challenge, um, humans, they vent in these situations and sometimes the blameworthy characteristics, they come to the fore. So with the lockdown and everything that's going on, there's a lot of people who are having massive problems with especially their close ones, which we've discussed earlier. So today we want to speak just about rifq, which is an important characteristic in Islam. If you look at the hadith books, there's chapters about this, Mishkat al-Masabi, many of the other books, it's about rifq. And the Prophet ﷺ has actually made very specific statements about it, has provided specific advice and guidance about gentleness. Rifq is gentleness. Essentially the opposite of harshness, the opposite of harshness and roughness is gentleness. So gentleness, <clears throat> that's why the first verse that I quoted, verse 159 of um, the third chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It's because of Allah's mercy, rahmah. So what I'm talking about is rifq, which is associated with rahmah. Rahmah has to be given to us for us to have gentleness. A person who basks in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should have gentleness. If you don't have gentleness, maybe we don't have the mercy or sufficient mercy. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It's because of the mercy of Allah, the rahmah of Allah that لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Again, the same concept, when something is layin, it means it's soft. So, linta, that you became soft, gentle. What does it mean by soft, that people walk over you? No. It's speaking, if you look at this verse, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْضًا غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ Had you been harsh and hard-hearted, they would have scurried away from you. They would have escaped from you. They wouldn't stay around you. Now one of the things that we have in our deen which is very important for us is that the Prophet ﷺ worked on an initial group of people that would die for him. The amount of respect that they had for him. They wouldn't, I mean, as the hadith mentions that they wouldn't allow, you know, not even a spittle to touch the ground from the Prophet ﷺ, saliva to, to touch the ground. That's how mad in love they were. Now, would that have been the case had the Prophet ﷺ been different? Had he been harsh? There wouldn't have been so. This is not to say that harsh people cannot have people around them that they control. But there's a different dynamic there. There's no love. There it's done out of fear. Or it's because you're going to get payment. Or because you're going to get a position. It's for exterior reasons. It's not the same thing. They're saying that one of the biggest uh, characteristics that a leader can provide is empathy. Is caring for those under them then those people want to give their life for this person. Then they'll do it for the right reason. 
and you'll be more productive. You'll, you'll have less burden, you'll have less stress. Because when people take the mission themselves, take up the job themselves, take up the idea and the dream and the purpose and the objective themselves, because they believe in you as the leader, because they believe in you as uh, somebody who's lovable, who's gentle, who's working for the right reason, then you're going to have a lot more productivity than having to drive a p people like an animal herd, for instance. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that statement. And this statement is made in, the, in a position of, you can say, leadership almost to a certain degree. Many of you will be thinking, well, we're not really leaders. You know, we're, we are not a minister, we are not an MP, we are not a senator, we're not uh, the prime minister, we're not a council member, we're not a councillor, you know, we're not even at the head of an organisation. Well, you may not be, but believe me, everybody has some kind of responsibility under them, whether that's, you're just the parents, you are just at the home, you're the husband, you're the wife, you know, you work with others. And that's leadership. In at some sense, and even if it's not leadership, this is not necessarily just about leadership, this is just about interaction, human interaction with people around us. That's why one of, uh, one of my, you know, one of the scholars who I really have a high regard for, I've benefited hugely from the kitabs, he was a Yemeni scholar whose name was Imam Abdullah ibn Alawi al Haddad. I've been totally amazed and really, really benefited from some of his books. That, that have been uh, published both in Urdu and many of them have been translated into English. So this is from one of his books, he talks about gentleness, he says that no, that gentleness is required in all things. It is encouraged and approved of in both Sharia and both by reason. How do you prove it through reason? Well, you would probably say that if you, de you know, you've probably dealt with many, many people in our life, you know, yesterday I was speaking to somebody and the whole discussion was the wife was complaining about the husband being very stingy and so on. So I was discussing, I said, I asked the husband, you know, I'm, have you seen anybody who's stingy among your friends? And he says, yes. I said, would you want to travel with them? Would you want to be with them? Or rather than somebody who's a bit more generous? So he said, no, obviously. So I said, well, it's the same kind of thing. You know, you wouldn't like it in others, so you shouldn't like it for yourself either. But we can't see it in ourselves as much. We can see it in others. So... We see it in reason as well. Have you dealt with people who are harsh? And have you dealt with people who are gentle? Right? You know? So, if the gentle person can get the same job done as the harsh person, sometimes you do need harshness. Right? Sometimes, it's, harshness is not without its benefits entirely. There are benefits, but the dominant state should be gentleness. So that's why he's saying that this is approved in both the sharia and reason. It is not just something sharia, although that would be sufficient for us. But it's only reason. If you think about it just logically, it's the same thing. Things can be achieved through gentleness that cannot even remotely be done through severity and force. There are sometimes you'll get things out of gentleness that you cannot get out of severity and force. I remember a, a fable that I read. I know it's, a, it's just a fable, Aesop's fables. I can't remember what it was when I was younger. And, you know, when you're young and you read these stories, I mean, something that left an impression. He said that the wind and the sun, they had an argument, they had a debate. Who is stronger? Subhanallah. I can't even believe that I'm mentioning this. I've probably never mentioned this story before. So the wind and the sun, they had an argument. They had a debate as to who is stronger. So they're arguing, arguing, and then, okay, I think somebody made, a, uh, somebody made up a, um, a competition for them. That, okay, if you're able to get this guy outside who's got his coat on and the shawl all wrapped up, whoever can get him to take his shawl off, blow his shawl off or whatever it is, then they win. They are the mightiest and they're the strongest. So the wind starts and it starts blowing gusts of wind and that guy is buttoning himself up and tightening himself, wrapping himself up even stronger and you know, even harder and making sure that he's holding on for dear life. So the wind tried and tried and tried and time was up, it couldn't do anything. Now the sun, it just started smiling. And I remember it was a picture book with the sun smiling. Right? SubhanAllah. You know, the sun is smiling and suddenly the guy starts feeling hot and he just starts taking his shawl off, then he took his coat off and there the sun went. So, I mean, this is... I guess to teach children that softness and gentleness. It's an interesting story. I don't think it's haram to say these stories, you know. But anyway, there you go. So that's through 
gentleness is the attribute of the wise. You know, that's a really interesting, I never prepared this story. It is a story I read years and years, and I've never mentioned it again in over 25 years, I would say. Today, 30 years. Probably 30 years I've never mentioned this story. And today it popped into the mind. Where does that come from? That's an interesting idea. You know, nobody's been able to understand where things just come into your mind. You know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, it's a good thing and it's not the shaitan. Gentleness is the attribute of the wise and the compassionate among those servants of Allah whom he has selected. And if you look at it, the Prophet ﷺ is our biggest exemplar, our greatest exemplar, and the incredible amount of gentleness that he expressed. And then many others after him, this is what made a leader. This is what made them the way they were, that they could be loved. What you can get out of love by being a leader is much more than you can get out of harshness by being a leader. God the Exalted described this Prophet وسلم, the master of mankind, may blessings and peace be upon him. And he said, it was by the mercy of God that you were lenient with them. For had you been stern and coarse of heart, they would have dispersed from around you. This is the verse that I read earlier. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in chapter 7 verse 199, Keep to forgiveness. Enjoin kindness and turn away from the ignorant ones. So keep to forgiveness. Keep forgiving. Don't be so harsh that you never forget. forgive. Allahu Akbar. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 25 verse 63, And the servants of the all-merciful are they who walk upon the earth gently. وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا هَوْنَ these are various different expressions of gentleness, of mercy. Ex expressions, hon, lean, all of these words. Forgiveness comes from there as well. It's a, it's a big idea. Gentleness is going to provide many different manifestations. It's going to manifest in different ways. In softness, in gentleness, in, in, in forgiveness, in easygoing nature. Th these are the kind of characteristics that people enjoy anyway. So, and the servants of the all-merciful are they who walk upon the earth gently and when the ignorant ones address them they say peace they say peace they deal with it in a peaceful manner that's another way to look at this the messenger of Allah may Allah bless him and give him peace said Allah is gentle and loves gentleness in all things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gentle and he loves gentleness in everything. And he also said gentleness never enters anything without embellishing it. And it is never taken out of anything without disgracing it. Essentially gentleness is an ingredient. It's a quality which if it's in something it will embellish it. It will just make it much more adorned and beautiful. And if it's taken out of something, if gentleness is taken out of something, then it will disgrace it, disfigure it, make it ugly. What exactly is gentleness then? Gentleness um, is to manage things. Now, this is the way we can check for ourselves how gentleness is, whether we have gentleness. Gentleness is to manage things with subtlety, with more tact, rather than with a sledgehammer. You know, some of us, by fitra, they take sledgehammers when they want to deal with something. They know who they are. I, I, I can, I can um, sympathize with this. I can understand this because I probably was something like this. right? When they're dealing with something, they deal with it in the most toughest of ways or hardest of ways or with a sledgehammer, as they say, you know, with the symbolic, metaphorical sledgehammer. Ease. So, no, you need to be more specific. Those... Even when they need to tap things, they have very specific hammers in which they tap different parts to get it right. Not with a big sledgehammer, you'll just destroy the thing. So that's what he's saying. You have to manage things with subtlety, with ease, with dignity. With dignity and with deliberation. You've carefully planned it. Aisha radiallahu anha said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was never given a choice between two things. But that he always chose the easier one, as long as it was not sinful. So we do have a criteria. It's not about choosing the sin, 
the easiest thing. The people mention this hadith sometimes, say, choose the easiest one, even though there's a bit of violation of Allah's rights there. No, as long as that's not the case. But when it was sinful, he was the remotest of people from it. He would not touch it. Those who most particularly need to use gentleness are those who occupy high positions of either religious or worldly responsibility. It more affects them because they have to deal with it on a day-to-day basis. With it, they are to treat people well and win them over. So win people over and thus become supported by the majority and gain many followers. So that people may be able to take from them in abundance. If you've got something good to distribute and to provide and to do in this world, then you need to use gentleness so then there's more people that will benefit. Otherwise, fewer people will benefit and no, nobody will benefit. In contrast, leaders who set aside gentleness and take to harshness and force can never enjoy wide support. They can have wide support, he explains, even when some appear to have such support, the, the, the very harsh leaders. Being tough is different to being harsh. Harsh is undignified. Being tough on cases where it's needed, that's dignified. That's required, in fact. Otherwise, it'd be cowardice. So he's saying, even when some appear to have such support, it can be no more than superficial, while inwardly there will be hatred, revulsion, and feelings of oppression among the people. They'll have to say yes, because otherwise they'll be persecuted, or whatever the case is, but there will not be happiness. That's why, subhanAllah, I don't know if anybody's had this discussion, but it's something that we need to have, and hopefully the right people will listen to it. Stop bothering the Muslims. Stop being harsh towards Muslims and Islam in this country. You will find that the Muslims are the best of people that can assist in the right causes. They have the right religion. They have the right ideas in their religion to make sacrifices. So you would be actually better off if you can get off your high horse and get away from all the ulterior motives and all of the other forces that you have to pander to. If you want really the best for your people, then be good to your Muslim population and you will see that they will give you the best in return. But when you act with this harshness and this belligerence and this suspicion and this discrimination, then you just bring out the worst in people. If the Muslims are doing so well despite all of this, then imagine if you were to do it well. And we've had examples of this in different countries, even in the modern times, where people are nice to Muslims in those countries. People, the Muslims will react in a positive way. Why do do Muslims need to react in a difficult way? It's because they feel incrimination. They feel that they're not been given their fair share, they've been, they've been attacked or their brothers and sisters have been attacked around the world. That's one of the main reasons. Because Muslims have a lot of empathy for one another. Muslims are a gro- global ummah. And that's something nobody can take out. Nobody can take away from them. It would always exist because that's Islam for the whole world of Muslims to be together. Yes, some of us are weak in that regard. who do not think about this on a day-to-day basis. But it is there. The love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands that. So this is, a, this is the uh, discourse that is needed to be had and hopefully the right people will understand that if they want to make any country prosperous in which Muslims live and Muslims live in, live in all sorts of places, the Muslims can really, as historically they have done, they can really make, make places and inshallah they won't then have to resort to some of the weird things that some, some Muslims are unfortunately resort, resorting to. But today is not the time for that. This is just a, a, a feeling uh, a, a topic that needs to be discussed. Thus, this is one thing very much. Gentleness is entirely good. You know, there's something which is good, but if you use it in some cases, it's bad. No, here he's saying that gentleness is always good. SubhanAllah. Right? People are going to be wondering, but in some cases, no. Look, gentleness is always good, and the intelligent man should apply to all things, especially in dealing with people. First of all, <clears throat> with one's family and servants, with one's family and employees. They're your closest. They require the most from you. They require the greatest amount of gentleness. That's where you have to practice this. I explained, uh, we gave a talk, I think it was the previous one, where we discussed how many of us, unfortunately, are actually more harsh with their own than they are with others. 
they're very professional and nice when it comes to others in the workplace and other people, but uh, in, other, in other situations when it comes to one's own family members, then the harshness comes out for some reason and that's very, very wrong. So he's saying that we, especially when dealing with people, first of all with one's family and servants, then with everyone else, it should never be neglected and it always yields the required results even if not immediately. It may take a bit longer. By taking a sledgehammer, you may be able to destroy the thing straight away. But with gentleness, you'll get something much better out of it. On some rare occasions, however, gentleness may be found ineffective. Especially in dealing with certain mean and ignoble creatures. How do you be gentle to them? They're so mean and ignoble, they just won't understand your gentleness. They'll take advantage of your gentleness. To tra treat such people with gentleness would be harmful to them. Because they with the intention they would be treated, they, they should be treated in an apparently harsh and severe manner. You have to sometimes deal with people in this tough manner, in an apparently harsh manner. They should be, but with the intention of reforming them and correcting their behavior. So it's like a medicine. It's not your normal status. You know, there's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Once a disbeliever said something. So he gave a really, really big insult. He said something really insulting to the other person. Unsus badr lat. Right? I don't want to translate it. It was quite insulting. Right? Now, there's some people who are very offensive in their speech. Some uh, religious da'is as well who are very offensive in their speech. And they use that as an example. Now, look, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, look what he said. It was a very, very extreme statement. Well, look, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said that once. He didn't say it on a day to day basis. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was one of the softest and kindness and gentlest person. That was one day when it was a serious situation and he said that. And okay, you can do that as well. You can be overwhelmed and do that. But if you're making that a sunnah of Abu Bakr Siddiq when it was not, you're making it as though it's his sunnah that he did it on a daily day to basis and you're using that one incident to say that this is normal, that's completely incorrect. That is not an analogy. That you go around using vile words against others, against other Muslims, against other Muslim scholars sometimes. The vilest words, up to kufr. You know, kufr candidates and kufr bootlickers and all of these kind of words. Right? And shaitani and all of that kind of stuff. And your, your justification is Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu's one statement. Sometimes you do have to use a bit of harshness in severe manner. But with the intention of reforming them and correct. So it's medicinal, it's therapeutic, it's just for the cure. It's very, it's done with a lot of elaborate thought. A certain Gnostic said that some people are only shells devoid of reason. They're just forms devoid of reason. If you do not overpower them, they will overpower you. Not far removed from this is Mutanabbi saying. Mutanabbi is an Arab, very famous Arab poet. He says, Generosity wins the loyalty of the generous. Generosity wins the loyalty of the generous. But with the vile, it breeds insolence. If you are generous to the vile, it will only make them more insolent. It's just the nature of the world. For to place liberality where the sword should be is as remote from excellence as the reverse. You, where, basically what he's saying is a way you need to use the sword. You can't be open-hearted there. You have to use the sword and we're not talking about that here, you know. Um, to get an Erturul sword or something and start using We're not talking about that, obviously, right? But these are rare instances involving deviant people of weak intelligence who have little good in them, being ignorant and foolish, with vicious natures and beast-like souls. They are only ones to be treated harshly. They are the only ones to be treated harshly with the aim of reforming them and as a protection against their viciousness. In this way, one should understand why, on certain occasions and with certain people, great men of Allah are rigorous. They're tough with those people. Why were they tough? The Prophet ﷺ was tough as well in certain cases. Especially after they opened up Makkah Mukarramah. There were some people who were even holding on to the cloth of the Kaaba, uh, seeking forgiveness, but their crimes were so much that the Prophet ﷺ said, no, they have to be, they have to be dealt with. Right? He forgave so many. 
He forgave the son of Abu Jahl. And he, gave, forg he forgave so many. But there were some people, their crimes were such that they couldn't be forgiven. So that's the Prophet ﷺ. Thus gentleness is the essence and rule. So your normal default rule and behavior and your normal quality and your normal uh, attitude is of gentleness. Except when it is feared that a worker of corruption may thereby step up his corruption and transgression. But it is felt, it is felt that he can be stopped only by a certain amount of severity and harshness. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enjoined gentleness and behaved gently in most situations. And this should be known to anyone familiar with his history, with the hadith and his pattern in teaching the ignorant and dealing with the near and the far ones. One example of this is the well-known hadith of the Bedouin who urinated in the masjid. Just imagine, you know, I mean, we've heard this story many times. Somebody comes and urinates here. Or somebody lets his child, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody's going to come and urinate here because we don't have that tradition of just urinating anywhere. Well, there are some people who still stand on street corners and edges and do their stuff. But generally, let's just say somebody came in, their child was like, okay, Bismillah, just do it here. You know, like, subhanAllah, you know. It's a child, man, you know. Somebody, I don't, Alhamdulillah, I don't think we get that anymore. But in those days, you see, what you have to remember is that this man wasn't so foolish. What it is, is that the masjid was not like this. There were no carpets in the masjid there. Right? It was just gravel, ground, sand, whatever it was. And that's what they do. They would just find a corner, they would do that, and they would cover it up. So the person thought, maybe I could do it here. I mean, it was a Bedouin, right? So for Bedouins, it's like anywhere. You know. uh, even today, you go to Mauritania, the Bedouin, they give you, you get one jug. And in that jug is your water for drinking, and your water for du, and your water for the toilet. It's that one jug. Now, people would not do that. You would never drink water here with water that you're going to take into the toilet with the jug. You know, you would not drink that water. But there, that's scarcity. That's the way they did things. It's a different paradigm and dimension. So that's why I'm going to give this person a bit of an excuse that, you know, he thought this was okay. He's not living in the city. He's not from the city. He's from the, from the you know, Bedouins. Um, when he came and, uh, you, you know the story. I don't need to explain. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them, look, don't stop him now. He's already started. It's going to be harmful for him to stop midway. Right? Let it happen now. We'll just sort it. And then he called him and he explained to him. Another is that of the other Bedouin man who, when given a donation by the Prophet ﷺ, was discontented and uttered things that he should not have said. At which the Prophet ﷺ's companion started to go towards him only to be stopped by the Prophet ﷺ, who then gave the man more and went on giving him until he was satisfied and spoke gracious words. Subhanallah. The third is that of the young man who said to the Prophet O Messenger of Allah, grant me permission to commit adultery. You know, like, Shaykh, let me, let me do adultery, man. I need to fornicate. Let me do adultery. Can you imagine? Somebody comes and asks you that. The Prophet replied, Would you like this to happen to your daughter? So he reversed psychology. Reverse psychology, use that on him. He answered no. So he said, likewise, other people do not like it to happen to their daughters. And he passed his hand over the young man's chest and prayed for him. SubhanAllah, what an effect of that. If only we could have also had the Prophet's hand over our heads, our chest, even on our shoulder. SubhanAllah, maybe in the hereafter, inshallah. Inshallah, in the hereafter. And from then on, nothing more was abhorrent to this man than adultery. There are many other such stories that have been narrated about him, as well as about the leaders after him, the scholars and the virtuous among our rightly guided predecessors and those of their successors who emulate them. So be gentle in all matters. It is a blessing and its consequences are good. Allah, Allah says, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ But none are granted it save those who are patient and none are granted it save the one who is greatly fortunate. So if we want this, we need to ask for two things. Number one, we need to have patience. And number two, we need to consider ourselves to be fortunate in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that Allah has written good for us. Which means we have to call unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would think that one of the biggest, what do you think? One of the biggest challenges to somebody who's always been harsh, harsh, harsh, to calm down would be that 
I'm going to lose my status. I'm known as a very tough person. And I'm known for that. It's almost like there's an arrogance built into that. There's a pride and arrogance built into that. It's about leaving that. It's tough. It is tough. There's a lot of things you have to change. It's, it's connected to so many different things. You have to unbolt, unscrew a lot of different issues and kind of re-envisage who you are and what you want to be. But why wouldn't you want to be like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? May Allah make it easy for us. May Allah make it easy for us. But gentleness is something that will adorn everything. May Allah grant us that gentleness. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make it easy and, and uh, make this truly a source of purification, elevation, and remove the difficulties that we are all having. And may Allah allow us to be stronger believers than weaker believers. Akhirul da'wana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma tassalamu alayka salam tabarak ala jalali wa nikra. Allahumma ya hayu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghif. Allahumma ya hannan ya mannan. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inna kunna min al-zalimin. Jazallahu anna muhammadan ma huwa ahlu. Ya Allah, have mercy upon us. Ya Allah, teach us. Ya Allah, allow us to learn. Allow us to know that which you want us to know. O oh Allah, forgive us. Purify us. O oh Allah, remove the darknesses from our life and from our hearts. O oh Allah, from our eyes. O oh Allah, protect us from looking, hearing, seeing, touching, and engaging with all that is wrong. O oh Allah, forgive us our many, many mistakes and many sins that we have committed in the past and that we may still be committing. O oh Allah, purify us. O oh Allah, make us satisfied with a life of goodness, life of virtue, a life of obedience. Make it beloved to us. Allow us to cherish it. O oh Allah, allow us to enjoy it. O oh Allah, grant us the halawat al-iman. Grant us the sweetness of our faith. O oh Allah, we know we don't try enough. O oh Allah, we engage in many wrongs. We have a lot of shortcomings. O oh Allah, but we ask for protection. We ask for for tawfiq, we ask for divine enablement. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, have your mercy upon us and the mercy upon the people of the world. O oh Allah, make us the way you want us all to be. O oh Allah, remove this calamity, this pandemic from, from the world. O oh Allah, allow us to be worthy of your mercy, worthy of your forgiveness, worthy of your generosity. O oh Allah, worthy of your clemency and your forbearance. O oh Allah, make our last moments, the best of our moments in this world. O oh Allah, make the end of our life the best of our days in this life. O oh Allah, make the time we stand in front of you the best moments of our existence. O oh Allah, bless the people of this masjid and all of those who facilitate to allow this program. O oh Allah, those who are listening today and saying, Ameen. And those who will listen say, Ameen. O oh Allah, accept all of our du'as. O oh Allah, accept our du'as. The, those of us who are sick, those who know people who are sick, O oh Allah, cure them, grant them afiyat, grant them afiyat. Those who have departed, O oh Allah, grant them absolute forgiveness and place in Jannah to fill those. And O oh Allah, allow us to make the rest of our life better than the previous part of our life. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi.